reading the water, casting the fly, setting the hook. There's a lot to fly fishing. Focus, patience, and practice. The rewards, though, are great. I'm John Veeman. Join me as we leave the horses halfway through Wyoming's Wind River Range and use our map and compass to locate a hidden lake where we're gonna fly fish for trout as we make our own adventure on Trailside. Come on, Big Steve. Wyoming may be famous for the Tetons and Yellowstone, but the Wind River Range in the center of the state is its most extraordinary and least known treasure. The Winds, as the range is called, features peaks over 13,000 feet, more than a thousand lakes, and some of the best fly fishing in the world. We're going to go deep into the Winds in search of one of those lakes, and I'm told it's never seen a fly rod, or at least nobody's talking about it. We're going to be starting our trip on horseback, a somewhat controversial but historically acceptable way to travel out here. And once we reach our base camp, we're going to leave the horses behind and use our navigation skills to hike the rest of the way. So let's get started. Jim Allen has been riding horses and fly fishing in the winds for over 25 years. For 11 of those years, he taught at the National Outdoor Leadership School, a leading proponent of leave no trace or low impact camping. Hey, Jim. Hi, John. Well, his roots run real deep here. His great-grandfather arrived here in a covered wagon over 100 years ago, and his grandfather was taking people back into the winds in the 1920s. Well, Jim, what's so special to you about horse packing? Well, horse packing's an ancient form of transportation dating back to beyond Genghis Khan's time. And I love the horses, and I love the mountains, and for me, it's the freedom to do both. Now, how does a horse's impact affect wilderness compared to, say, a backpacker? Well, horses have an impact. We all have an impact, actually. But there's a few things I'd like to show you that we can do to minimize that impact. Okay. Well, horses, of course, have been out here for a long time, huh? Yeah, there have been horses on these trails for a hundred years. But the frontier is changing, and we've got to learn how to use our wilderness resource in a responsible way. And if we do that, I think we can do this for at least another hundred years. I see you're using two cinches here. Why is that? We've got to have one on the front to hold the saddle in place, and the one in the back keeps the saddle from tipping forward, which is pretty important in these rugged mountains because we've got some 12,000 foot, foot peaks and some really deep canyons, and so it's not like riding on a flat trail. Well, these panniers remind me a lot of the pannier system you use on a bicycle. Actually, that's where the bikers got the idea was from horse packing. This is the most widely used packing system in the world, a sawbuck pack saddle and a pair of panniers. These just happen to be hard panniers as opposed to soft panniers. And the reason we picked this hard set for this trip is so that they would protect our food that's down in the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, you distribute the weight evenly. How much weight can you carry on these horses? Well. 150 pounds is the maximum, and you're right, the load has to be balanced so that it doesn't shift and pull over. So it'll take a horse and a half for us to go on our pack trip. You got the fishing rods in there? Yeah, right here. Okay, well let's get saddled up. Sounds good. Well, what's the name of this horse? That's Big Steve. Big Steve, huh? You gotta watch him. Well, what kind of personality does he have? Cantankerous. <laughs> so you just remember, you're the boss. Okay. Looks like you've ridden some. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. It's been a while. These horses are all neck rein broke? Yeah, they sure are. A little bit of rain pressure on the right side of the neck will make them turn to the left. Like that. Kick them to go forward. Reins in the left hand. You got it. Looks good. Like now those, good. Yeah, now those bells on the horses back there, they keep you awake at night? No, not really. There's an old cowboy saying that bells at night, wranglers sleep tight. Oh, now what's that mean? <laughs> well, if you don't hear bells, you don't have horses, and that means you might have to walk home. Uh. So how long of a ride do we have ahead of us today? Pretty much all day. 
We'll set up camp and then tomorrow let's head on foot up to a lake I've never been to before. I think you ought to be the navigator. Okay. What's the name of it? Doesn't have a name. I've just seen it on the map is all. So when are we meeting up with this great angler who's coming along with us? Tomorrow morning, right before we head out. I see you're wearing some chaps. Is that to protect your knees from the trees? <laughs> I can see what part of the country you're from. These are chaps. <laughs> Well, I gave yeah. myself away, huh? They do that, and they also keep the rain off, and besides, they really look cool. <laughs> Real cowboy. <laughs> so what's the trail like up ahead? The trails here in the Wind Rivers are rugged and rocky and rough and a lot of switchbacks and stuff. So we're going to have to just go along single file as soon as we get there. Okay. When do we stop to give the horses a rest? We don't need to give them a rest, but our knees might give out on us. We might have to get off and lead them a little and loosen up. But you know, that's a great thing about horse packing is you can actually enjoy the scenery and just leave the driving to the horses. Continental Divide is right up there, and that lake ought to be in that high cirque right below it. You sure do know your way around these mountains. Well, I guess. I better go get the horses. Okay. Well, when you're in the backcountry, you won't have a Jim Allen along to tell you where you are, so it's important that you have the two basic tools to do it yourself, a topo map and a compass. Now, before you set out, you want to adjust your compass for declination, which is the difference between magnetic north and true north. As you can see, I've already adjusted this compass for the winds by setting the orienting arrow 14 and a half degrees east of north on the compass housing. Now the declination is always on the corner of your topo map, so it's easy to find. Now how you're going to locate yourself in an area like this is through a technique called triangulation. And that has two assumptions, that you can visually make out two obvious landmarks and that you can find them on your topo map. Now where we are, it's fairly easy. There's a pretty prominent butte right up here and then right over here just beyond this tree is a pretty obvious peak and that peak is pretty close to us so we should be able to find it pretty easily on our topo map and sure enough you can see there's nothing else around here so there's that second landmark now I've already triangulated our position but let me show you how I did it you start by taking a field bearing and to do that you take your compass and you put it between yourself and your first landmark, in this case our butte, which was called Dishpan Butte on the map. And then you turn this compass housing until your magnetic north on your compass lines up with your orienting arrow inside the compass. And that gives you a bearing of 284. Then you take your compass right down to the map and you turn it until these red orienting lines on the compass housing are parallel the geographic north lines on, that are gridded out on your map. Then you just slide it over right to Dishpan Butte and then you draw a line right along the base of the compass. Then you take your compass and you go to your second landmark and again you line it up through the guides and you go all the way around until your arrows are lined up and your compass needle is there and you got 160 degrees south Again, you bring it down to your map, you draw a line along the base, and where they intersect is right where you are, and we're four miles from camp tonight. Wow. Pretty nice. Really nice. Any names for the peaks over there? Not very many of them are named. Too many of them. Why don't we camp right over there? Over that way. Streams are over there where we'll be fishing. Long day, huh? Yeah, but worth every minute of it. These horses okay out here in the meadow like this? Oh yeah, horses and grasslands have co-evolved and it's perfectly natural. In fact, it's even part of the nutrient cycle. Now how are we gonna keep them from wandering off? I, I brought some leather hobbles to put on their front feet. That ought to keep them from running home. 
Well, why not just tie them up to the trees over here? Some people do that, but it can kill the tree when they paw the, the uh, bark back on the roots. It can kill them. So we don't like to do that. Huh. There any bears out here? <laughs> yeah, this is prime black bear habitat. In fact, what we better do is tie our food up in a, between those two trees up there. We're really lucky. We might even hear an elk bugle tonight. Well, that'd be great. Well, let's get camp set up. I think I can hear some fish calling over there in that stream. Okay. When I'm backpacking, I always camp about 200 feet back from any water source, so it's good to see you guys do that when you're horsepacking. Well, that's right. You can't have low-impact horse camping without low-impact human camping. Now, what's your secret to fish in these little extremes? Well, the fish are facing into the current, and the water's shallow. So the trick is to sneak up and cast over the bank where they can't see you. Then we'll work upstream. How oh, come we're keeping these missed, fish? There we go, there we go, got him. You got one? Yep. Oh, good size one. Yeah. Good rookie. Here, I got him. You got him? Look, whoops. <laughs> Almost had him. I'm your guy. Oh. All right. Now, how come we're keeping these? I thought you guys practiced catch and release. Well, we do, but I've fished these streams all my life, and this particular stream is overstocked with these small brookies, so we're doing the stream a favor by culling a few. Well, are brook trout native to this stream? No, just the cutthroats. All the others were planted for the early part of the century. Well, that's a pretty nice sized fish. Yeah. So what's the best time of day to fish these creeks? Whenever you're hungry. <laughs> Good idea using the cornmeal for the fish. These backpacking stoves are real light and fast too. You ever use campfires out here? Yeah, yeah, it depends on the campsite. You know, up at Timberline, it's not a good thing to do because the ecosystem is so fragile. But down here, there's a lot of wood. And if we use dead wood and keep our fire small, it works. It's okay. Hmm. Want some more cowboy coffee? Oh, I'd love some. I need a warmer. <laughs> Now what do you guys do when you break camp and you've made a campfire? One really good way to have a fire is to take your shovel and dig a square piece of sod out of a wet, damp meadow like we're in. Set it aside. After your fire's uh, done and you're leaving, wet the coals down real well, bury them in the mud, then put the sod back and nobody will ever know you were there. Hmm. Good idea. Well, there's a fire ban on right now, isn't there? Yeah, I called the Forest Service like I always do before every trip and found out about it. That's why we're using this stove. Ugh. I was looking at the map. That lake we're going to, is, it's doable, but it's going to be one big hike. No cakewalk, that's for sure. Probably take us about four hours. I think you got her figured out, huh? Yeah. Well, I've fished about every lake around here but that one because of its remoteness so I have high hopes and I really hope we do well up there. I always wanted a home on the range. <laughs> night Jim. Good night John. Okay, horses are all set. How do you know they're not gonna wander off while we go fishing? Well I've got yours staked and since he's the ringleader his friends will stay. Well, we're about to head to our special lake. And we know where we are and we know where we're going, but how we're gonna get there is by taking a map bearing. You do that by first lining your map up to north with your compass needle. And then you just wanna lay your compass right down on the map and use the edge as a straight edge. You line up one edge with the meadow where we are and the lake where we want to go up there in the hills. And then you just turn the compass housing until in red orienting lines line up with the parallel with the grid lines on the map. And it looks like we want to head due west or 280 degrees. Now we've already adjusted the compass for declination, remember. So then we stand up and we turn our entire body until the magnetic arrow lines up with the orienting arrow inside the compass and then we bring it up and we take a visual sighting right through these guides on the compass and it looks like we'll be going we'll use as a visual guide this little knob right up here on the top it looks like a small volcano now if we happen to lose 
our visual guide, we can always just pull the compass right out of our pocket, and it's already set at 280 degrees, so we can take a compass bearing from there and be right back on course. Here comes our fishing partner right now. Perfect timing. Hey guys, I'm glad I caught up with you. Nice to see you, Christy. Nice to see you again, Jim. How are you? Hi, and Christy. nice to meet you in yeah. person. Yeah. I would have been here a little sooner, but the fishing has been so good. Oh really? It's hard Great. to leave rise and fish. Great. <laughs> I second that. Well, Christy Ball is one of the top anglers in these parts. She's been a fly fishing guide in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming for over four years and taught all kinds of fishing all over the world. You guys all set? Ready to go. What kind of fish do you think we'll get up there? I think brookies. Maybe a cutthroat. <laughs> this is navigating the traditional way, but there's a new and exciting high-tech system to guide you through the wilderness and let you know exactly where you are. Before we came out here, I met with Jim White and he showed me how it works. Take 24 satellites, add 13 billion dollars and a computer the size of a small radio, and what do you get? A global positioning system that lets you find your exact location anywhere on Earth. Hi, Jim. Hi, John. Well, Jim White works for Magellan Systems, one of the companies that's developed handheld receivers for outdoor enthusiasts. Now, tell me how this works. Well, this was developed by the Department of Defense uh, during the 1970s to provide worldwide positioning and navigation. And with a GPS receiver, you're going to pick up signals from those satellites you were talking about, and it'll calculate your position location anywhere in the world. Now, what numbers am I looking at here on this screen? What you see here on this screen are the precise latitude and longitude coordinates for this location. You're also seeing the elevation for this location because we're locked onto four satellites. Now, how does this work in adverse weather? It's great. The beauty of GPS is it not only is worldwide at any time of the day, but it'll work in any kind of weather so you won't get lost. You want to show me how it works down here in the field? I'd be glad to. To give you an idea how you can use GPS to navigate from one point to another, I've created a little test. What I did was uh, walk out to a remote location, set up a campsite, and now I've recorded that in the unit's memory so that we can navigate back there from any point in the world. What it's telling us is that from our present position, we need to go at a, at a heading of 282 degrees magnetic for a distance of just about a mile. And this little circle with the plus sign in it is our, that campsite you set up. That's exactly right. And as we walk and we walk towards that location, you'll see the circle move towards the top of the arc. Okay. When it does, we're right on target. Okay. We've got to go around some obstacles at the moment so that we can't go in a straight line, but this allows you to see your orientation to that campsite nonetheless. So th this won't tell you where any natural obstacles are, like a ravine or a river, so you still need a map and compass with you, right? You're absolutely right. You should never go out into the backcountry without your map and without your compass. But for now, what I'd like to do is have you stop right here, because with a five-minute head start, I'm going to go to camp, and I'd like you to find your way using GPS. OK. See you later. All right. Now, if I'm not there in five minutes, is this thing going to self-destruct? Hey, John. Well, that didn't take long. Yeah. How was it? Well, I have to admit, I had a lot of help from above. <laughs> well, how about some coffee? That sounds good. What a gorgeous place. This is even better than I thought it would be. <laughs> 280 degrees, dead on. Just goes to show you got to trust your compass. Well, you saw it first, Jim. What do you want to name it? Bob. <laughs> Bob. Let's, Bob. Let's call it Bob. <laughs> Well, let's rig up these rods and see if there's any fish in Lake Bob. I hope so. Well, 
Well, you guys, I think I'll try fishing near the outlet. Have a good time. Thanks. You too. Good luck, Jim. Well, how do we go about fishing a lake like this? Well, what I like to do is, is approach, approach the bank slowly. We wouldn't want to walk down here too quickly and take the chance of spooking any fish that might be hiding in these rocks. And also, I like to look to see if there's any rising fish, generally, just what's going on with the water here. I don't see uh, many rises, and I don't see a lot of bugs. Aquatic insects are the mainstay of the trout's diet. When there's a lot of bugs, you see the fish coming up on the surface and, and eating them. So we're going to have to lure them up. Seems like a lot of work. Whatever happened to worms? Well, worms work, but it's not fly fishing. Fly fishing offers its own special set of challenges. Uh, one thing that I particularly like about fly fishing is that I fish exclusively catch and release. What I catch, I put back. And uh, you take the chance when you're bait fishing that the fish takes it a lot deeper and uh, it's harder to let them go without, without hurting them. And the most fun part is what we're doing is we're stalking these fish and we're imitating their diet. That's the whole purpose of the fly. These are the flies? Yeah. Look at that. I wouldn't even know where to begin with something like this. Yeah, so this is what we use to trick the fish and the, and the possibilities and the selections. There are a lot of them out there on the market. What I suggest people do is to go to a fly shop near the area you're going to be fishing and, and ask the people that work in those shops what they suggest. They won't steer you wrong. Well, we've got a local. Hey, Jim, what are you using? Whatever works. Well, what's going to work for us? Well, since I didn't see any specific bugs down there near the edge, I think we ought to go with the attractor pattern. We're going to have to bring them up. And what's an attractor pattern? An attractor pattern is, a, is just a yummy bug. It can imitate a lot of different types of things. It's not any specific bug. This is a, a classic, which I think everyone should have in their box. And this is a, a parachute Adams, a great fly. Another real popular attractor pattern and a real beauty, a particularly yummy looking one I think, is the royal wolf. And I think you ought to give that a try. Okay. I think I'll go with uh, this Turk's tarantula here. Looks like a good bug. You gotta believe in your bug. You gotta think like a fish and I think this looks pretty yummy. There's probably been more written about fly fishing than any other sport, but everyone develops their own style. There's a couple basics that I'd just like to go over. Personally, I like this thumb on top grip. It makes me feel like I have more control over the rod. Another thing that I think is real important is looking at this fly rod as an extension of my forearm. It makes me feel like I'm more in contact with what's going on out here. Why don't you give it a try? Okay. So it's not a wrist move, huh? Nope, it's not in the wrist. Actually, that looks real good. Oops. Whoops. That cast looked real good. <laughs> there you go. All right, so our goal here is to uh, get that fly out to where the fish are. The wind's kind of getting you. Yeah. So the line is what's going to take that fly out there. And it's the rod that makes the line go. So we need to concentrate on what this rod's doing. Okay, so you've got your back cast right there and that forward cast. You start your forward cast, real nice cast, right, right there. You've got to pause right with your rod tip straight up like you were doing. Give that line time to straighten out behind you. So it's a real timing thing, huh? Yeah, that looks great. Yes, it's all timing. Beautiful. I got one. Come on there, little guy. Come on. Here we go. Here we go. Come on. Come on in. There we go. Come here. 
There we go. It's a great feeling catching a trout, and an even greater one releasing it for another lucky angler. As an old trout guide once said, it's a lot like golf. You don't have to eat the ball to have a good time. We'll see you next time on Trailside. Okay, little guy, you're off the hook. There you go. Off you go. Is that your favorite horse? Oh, not really. He's a good horse, but I usually ride the young colts that we raise and break, and then once they're going pretty good, I'll switch on over to another new colt. Any of your kids ride? Yeah, we have three young girls and they all like to ride and they have horses. And I would love it if they'd follow in my footsteps, but I'm not gonna force it on them. Howdy. Hey there. Where you been? Oh, down at Sweetwater Lake. Catch any fish? Not this time. Well, we'll see you guys. Have a good trip. Take it easy. Jim, how's this system work? Well, John, it, uh, it works. It calculates your position any place in the world, but uh, it was developed by the U.S. Department of Defense, and it is classified information, and if I told you how it works, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was great. Uh, guys, we're about ready to come in and block this thing out and, uh, and do it. Wouldn't mind doing one more. You wouldn't mind doing another one? Let's do the wild sound right Doing this though. wild track right here. And okay. Rolling. Want me to be walking? 52, take two. All speed, me, lifeless, and action! What do horses and fish have in common? Well, when you're in Wyoming's Wind River Mountains, horses are the traditional mode of travel. And fish are a big part of what brings people to the many streams and lakes inside the range. See where that far corner is? On the rock or the On the bank. Okay, way over. Past deep. Past deep. Yeah. Jim Allen had to be the perfect guest for this kind of show. He's been a guide in Wyoming since he was 15 years old. In fact, he prides himself oh, yeah. on having been the youngest guide ever licensed in the state. And that was 25 years ago. Jim has over 70 horses in his herd, so he made sure I had a nice, quiet one to ride. I have to admit that I'm not much of a wrangler, as they call the cowboys out there, and even less of a fisherman, so I had some reservations about this episode. Why don't you go to the first stuff about the rod? As for fly fishing, I came away hungry for more of it. A few lessons with Christy and I think I did a pretty fair job of throwing a line. Jokes about my casting from the production crew aside, at least more than one fish agreed with me. You'll notice on this episode that we never quite tell you where we're fishing. And that's deliberate. Any good fisherman never tells you where the fish are, and after all, finding them on your own is a big part of the adventure, isn't it? Finally, that question you probably wanted me to answer, does the wind really howl in the Wind River range? Absolutely. The stars dance with the trees, too. Those nights sleeping under a full blanket of stars were some of the most relaxing I've spent on any trail site shoot. Hey, this one even has a couple slings around it so we don't have to use our own. Well, I don't know about that. We want to take a good look at them before we trust our life to them. First, you want to look at the knot, make sure it's tied well. You can see that this one isn't. Now and what? then, yeah, see, this could pull through and actually come untied on a rappel. Bad mm -hmm. idea. This, you want to look inside the knot also and see if it's faded from the rest of the webbing. And if it is, that usually means it's been out in the sun too long and it could be weakened by the sun quite a bit. But in both of these, you can see these horrible burn marks that the rappel lines have made by being pulled down from down uh, below. Mm -hmm. That really weakens the webbing, so uh, I think we better use ours. Yeah, good idea. 
<coughs> now, what kind of knot are they using to tie up these slings? That's a ring bend, and it's a, it's a real simple knot, but, and it's much, much better than a square knot. You start with a nice little overhand knot like that, mm -hmm. no twists, then you just follow it back through. It's a very simple and very safe knot. Now, how much load can one of these slings handle? The average car could be held in the air with these. You know, they hold over 4,000 pounds, so they're mm. very safe. Now, what's this piece of hardware? That's a descending ring. And instead of putting the rappel line through here, we'll put it through the ring. And that way we won't uh, burn the webbing, and it'll be easier to pull down from below. Mm. Well, we should probably cut these off, right? Good idea. We'll just take that stuff with us. So how do you train older dogs? Well, I put them in harness like this uh -huh. and with a lead to their collar so I can teach them their commands. Yeah. G for mm -hmm. right. Good girl, Petra. Ha, ha. Good girl. Yes. But I have another technique that I use. Uh -huh. Do you have a dog at home? Yeah, I've got a big old Newfoundland. Oh, great. This is one you could use. You'll like this. Okay. Put those skis on there. All right. It's called ski joring. Yeah. And I use it for my dogs because then I get a lot of one-on-one -on -one with the dog. And I also can teach them their commands. But other people can use it if they have just one dog. What happens a lot is people come here and they get to go mushing with six dogs, mm -hmm. but they can't necessarily go home and uh, buy six dogs. Right. So they can use their dog at home for that. Okay. Got the harness on. Yep. This is called a quick release. Ah. Put it in like this. How come I have a feeling I'm going to be using this? Yeah, you better check it out. All Pull right. back. There you go. Okay. Just in case you, you know, need to... Let go of the dog. All right. Do a face plant or something here. Okay. Okay. Let's hope not. <laughs> this goes to the harness of the dog. Right. We tell the dog, stay tight. Good girl, Petra. Stay tight, Petra. Stay tight. Good stay tight, girl. Petra. All right. Now be okay, nice. Okay, now be what's nice the word to, to go? Hike, hike. Hike, hike. All right. Hike, hike, hike Petra. Hike, hike. hike. Let's Petra. go. Hike, Good hike. girl. Hike, hike. Good girl. Hike, hike. Hike, hike. Hike, hike. Hike, hike. Hi, Kirk. There's a couple things I think about when I'm making pictures. Okay. One, you got to have light to make a shot outdoors. Makes sense. Yeah. So I think about how that light interacts with my environment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the sunset, we call it backlighting. Right. Yeah. Now, if it's the lights over our shoulder and lighting the background, mm -hmm. we call it front lighting. Uh -huh. Sometimes... You, like right after a rain that just got us here, you, know, yep. you get a really dramatic rainbow. Yep. Now, what would you do if, if you did get a rainbow? Would you put a filter on? What would you do? Yeah, I probably would, because a polarizing filter really makes a rainbow pop. Okay. You know? And the other kind of lighting is side lighting, and this is a really good spot to show you that. Mm -hmm. the side lighting would rake along the texture of these lichens mm -hmm. and really brings up that texture. Yeah. And especially nice now because they're all wet from the rain. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about light, and I'm thinking about shapes, okay. forms, patterns. For instance, look over here. Okay. Now, what I try to do when I'm making pictures yeah. is to really forget about what it is that I'm photographing and look at it in terms of what shape it or form it is. Mm -hmm. This looks almost looks like a bonsai tree under here. Huh? Yeah. For instance, this S-curve right here is a really dramatic compositional tool to use when making pictures. Mm -hmm. So I'd make a shot of that. Mm -hmm. And then while I was here, I'd probably lie down and, you know, look at this up here. Okay. Oh, yeah. And it's a really nice pattern of branches, uh -huh. and it's echoed by the pattern of the needles. Now, what kind of lens would you use to shoot something like this? Well, I'd probably shoot this with a real wide-angle lens so I can get as much of that pattern as possible. Before we get into anything too complicated, let's get our communication down. Like if I see a rock on the right, should I say rock right or should I say go left to avoid it? Always tell me which direction you want me to go. It's real hard to hear in a rapid and we need to be keep it short and sweet. It's either going to be go right or go left. But the important thing is to be consistent. It's really hard to overcome that natural instinct to talk about the obstruction you see as opposed to how to avoid it. Well, that's true, but I'll be depending on you to tell me which direction to go. Hey, there's Annie. Yeah, she's pulled over. She's signaling. She's saying, 
stop, pull over river right. Well, we must be at the head of Rock Island Rapid, and she's probably pulled over to scout it. Whenever you're traveling with more than one canoe in a party, it's always good to have a non-verbal communication system. In this case, we're using the universal river signals, and they're actually quite simple. To signal someone to stop, you just take your paddle, hold it horizontally over your head. To signal them to pull over, say, river right, hold it on a diagonal and move it slightly so they can see it. River left, on a diagonal, move it slightly. If everything's OK and they can proceed on straight through, just hold it vertically above your head, moving it just to make sure they can see it. Now, you can build on that basic system, but the important thing with your signals is to keep them simple, be consistent, and always direct the other canoe where you want it to go as opposed to pointing out an obstruction somewhere in the river. Are you ready to pull over and scout with them? Yeah, let's check it out. Well, you really don't get much swing with your arms when you're carrying a pack on skis, do you? Well, you really don't. One of the things that I find helpful is to shorten my poles a little bit shorter than you normally would for cross-country skiing uh -huh. because you're not swinging your arms as much. Yeah. Uh, that really helps keep your stability and helps not fatigue your shoulders. Yeah. Well, you know, these new clip systems really make it a breeze to adjust your length on your pole, don't they? Yeah, those are nice, a nice setup. You know, one of the other things I find helpful is to not take real long strides, but short steps mm -hmm. helps uh, save energy as well as give you a little bit better balance on your skis. So in that sense, it is just like walking with a pack. You know, you've got to, you've got, the more weight you have, the shorter your stride to keep yourself centered, huh? Yeah, that's it. It's exactly right. When you travel with a canoe on a vehicle, you want to always have four tie-down points. Now, the two belly bands on the crossbars will hold the canoe securely to the roof racks. And the lines front and rear will keep it from twisting in the crosswinds. Now you want your lines to be taut, but not so tight that they might crease the canoe or maybe even crack it. And most important, don't just tie your lines and then forget about them. You want to stop and double check them after you've traveled a couple of miles and then every stop after that. Oh, hey. You checking your granny knots? <laughs> yeah, granny knots, that's the world famous trucker's hitch. It's my job to do that, how about yours? Trailside is brought to you in part by Chevy Trucks. Next time you're having fun outdoors, make sure Mother Nature has a good day, too. And L.L. Bean, providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. And high-tech sports, who invite you to enjoy the great outdoors and follow the trail to adventure. <laughs>